Good morning. Warm welcome to you all as we gather together uh, to worship and celebrate. A warm welcome to everyone who is joining us on the live stream or watching at some time later. It's good for us to share uh, with you at home and with those of us who are here. Today, as we worship, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And if you're at home or watching on the live stream, if you have bread and wine uh, ready, you can join with us at that part in our service. Let me uh, remind you all of the concert we're having on the 12th of July, uh, half past seven, with the Baylor Jazz uh, Band, who are coming from Texas uh, to play various concerts around Scotland over the summer. Um, they're playing for free. Uh, they're not taking any fee for the concert. Uh, and so all the, the money is raised at the concert. We're donating to the Red Cross appeal to support the, the relief work in Ukraine. So please do remember that concert on the 12th of July. Um, bring your family and your friends and come along uh, and enjoy an evening of music together. Just a bit of notice, we're getting near uh, the holiday season and it, Gordon and I are both away during July. Uh, and so it might be that some weeks there isn't any weekly email during July. And for at least two weeks, the 10th and the 17th, um, because of computers and things, we won't be able to live stream the service on those Sundays. Uh, but otherwise, uh, everything will, will go on. Uh, over the summer. Uh, but just to let you know, it's not a mistake if a weekly email doesn't come out. It's just we might both be away at the same time and, and can't get one delivered. <clears throat> In these last days, it will be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Our hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, not least of the Pentecostal blessings, is the outpouring of God's love upon us, within us, and through us to our neighbors and our friends. At this table, at this service, as we remember Jesus, we remember the Father's gift of love to us. And we share and celebrate the Father's love for each one of us together. We worship God as we sing words from Psalm 24. Ye gates lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for a.
Let's pray together. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love and grace with which you sustain us day by day. We thank you for the promises of your presence with us in every part of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that as we meet together this morning, others are meeting all over the country in the same way to worship you and learn from you and to share in fellowship with others. Thank you for that great family of believers that we are part of. We pray that you will bless your church and help us to grow in love with each other and towards those who do not yet know you. We thank you that we have the privilege of walking with Jesus and bearing his name and for the joy that he has brought into our lives and the purpose we have in serving him and the meaning he gives to everything we are and do. But we confess, Lord, that we do not always live like this is true. We want to go our own way and leave you out. Forgive us for these times, we pray, and help us to keep you in your rightful place in our lives. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us as we worship in song, hear your word, offer our prayers, and hear what you have brought to us this morning. Help us to draw closer to you. And hear us as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Two microphones, eh? That's going to be, that's going to be difficult. We would, um, in past years, have had a, a Thanksgiving service today with young people coming uh, to get books. And we do have books for those young people who have been uh, part of the life of our congregation over the past year. Um, some of them aren't here today, so uh, Gordon, I think, is going to uh, take those round uh, to, to home in the next few days or so. But we do have one young person here, Cameron, um, who's going to come up. We're going to talk to Cameron for a wee minute. You can tell by how relaxed he's looking. Cameron finished school a few weeks ago. A, a relaxing time. Yes? Yeah, this, yeah, it's on. No, you need to hold it. Yeah. yeah. So a bit of a relaxing time. So Cameron's finishing school, and, and it's been our, our custom to have a Bible uh, for young folk who are finishing school before going on to what's coming next. But I thought that uh, we were talking about missionary stories uh, for, for a few weeks there, um, and Cameron's got a missionary story uh, of, of what he's been doing, and I thought we'd have a few questions, and we could hear some of the things that Cameron's been doing to serve in mission in different ways. So, Cameron, um, you've been very involved in the Scripture Union Group at your school. Tell us a wee bit about what you've been doing and how that's been going. Uh, so, a couple of years ago, I did the training called the Equip Pupil Leader Training online, uh, and then led the SU group online for about a year. Um, and then we were allowed to get back in person again, so I led it in person again for another year. And I could honestly say it's never been as busy as it was when we got it back. It was remarkable how many people we had there. So g give us a, s a number. How many, on average, what, what would be a good day? You would go a, home and a, say, that was a good day we a had. A good day, maybe 10 Ten like that. Wow, that's really Which great. Which is pretty good. That's really great. And what sort of things did you do at the issue group? Uh, well, normally we would come in, people would eat their lunch, and we would have a chat. Uh, and then we would, we watched a lot of videos from an organisation called Solas, which would talk about difficult <coughs> questions to do with Christianity and how we can answer them and things like that. So we would watch those videos and then talk about the questions ourselves. Okay. Interesting, Cameron mentions that ministry called SOLAS, S-O-L-A-S. Um, go on the website. The, their material's not only 
for, for young people, um, or at least it's not only aimed at young people, but many of us would benefit from watching uh, some of their, their films and videos engaging with uh, current issues uh, and helping us think through them from a Christian way. So it's good that you've been using that resource and we've got a chance to commend it to one another. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, you went to something called Base Camp. Tell us about Base Camp. What's it for and, and what did you do? Well, it was on the Isle of Arran at a place called King's Cross. Um, and we would go there, we would train to become leaders at SU camps. Uh, so we did lots of different, looked at different aspects of being a leader, uh, used examples of Jesus doing this, that, and this is how he did this part of being a leader and this part. Um, and we also looked at David a lot there. Um, and so it was a really good week. How many really folks were at base camp, roughly? I think 45. 45 young people going to get trained to help at ASU holidays and missions over the summer. What was the top tip they gave you for getting young people into bed and asleep <laughs> at the end of the day? Uh, you need to be patient. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. That sounds great. And, and many folks here will know Arne, and I'm sure lots of folks will have been to King's Cross uh, at some time. So you've been training uh, for ASU holidays and missions. Are you going to be doing any? Have you done any already? Are you going to be doing any over the summer? Well, I've done a couple already, um, and I'm doing one more. It starts next Saturday, which is also going to be at King's Cross. Um, and I'm also obviously going to be involved in the holiday club that this church runs with Colton and uh, with another one as well, which is with Curry and Juniper Green. Right, so that's two holiday clubs and back to Arn uh, next Saturday. Yeah. Do you know what the theme is for your, your week at Arn uh, or anything about what age your children are coming? Uh, I think the age is kind of upper primary, lower secondary. I'm not sure what the theme is there's going to be a meeting about it tomorrow so we'll right. find out you'll find out tomorrow yeah okay but that sounds great and, and we're really encouraged that uh, you, you've been serving in mission in your school and uh, in these these different ways going for training and serving over the summer uh, and we'll look forward at the end of the summer maybe you could take some pictures uh, and come and tell us about what you were doing at king's cross and at these different holiday clubs Cameron, it's been great for us to share with you and watch you growing up all these years. We've got this Bible for you as you leave school and go on to whatever's coming next. Um, so let's say a prayer together, uh, especially for Cameron, just before you go back down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Cameron. Uh, thank you for your work in his life and your calling him to serve in mission in so many different ways. We pray that Cameron's answering that call would encourage us that we too uh, can answer your call and serve in mission in our places. We do especially pray for the camp at Arne beginning next Saturday. Pray for all the young people who will come and for all the team that everyone would travel safely and that they would have a good week and that many folks would come to know more of Jesus for themselves through that week. We pray for holiday clubs uh, the one we're doing here and the one at, at Juniper Green and Curry, which Cameron will be involved in, and ask that you would strengthen him for this summer of service. Guide Cameron wisely as he thinks about what's coming next and pray that you would bless him. Hear our prayers, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, thanks, Cameron. Going to sing together again, um, and our next hymn is... My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you.
reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 7 and going through to verse 15. But, this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be man manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Amen. God will bless this reading of his word to us. As we respond to God's word, let's stand together and profess our faith. We're going to use the words of the Apostles' Creed, which will come up on the screen. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for all you give us, and we pray that you will use our offerings to grow your kingdom. We pray for the families of those who were killed in the recent earthquake in Afghanistan, and for the many hundreds who have been injured. Help the agencies who are trying to bring help to these people, and that they will have all the supplies and equipment they need. We pray that those in charge in that country will accept all the help they are offered, so that those in need can be helped as quickly as possible. We pray also for the people of Mozambique who have been suffering from violent attacks by the armed militias and through the terrible tropical storms which have caused so much devastation in an already desperate situation. We pray that the schools, medical centers, and food supplies that have all been badly affected can be replaced and that the aid agencies will be able to work freely to meet needs without interference. We pray for Tear Fund's partnership with local people and that it would show fruit in the lives of those most affected. We ask you to help Gordon, Andy and Jill in the Kirk session as they continue to work through the presbytery plan and what it will mean for us and for the church as a whole. Guide their thinking and the decisions they have to make so that we will have a strong church which focuses on our mission to so show Jesus to the people who don't know him. Lord, we thank you for the volunteers in the church in Ghana who are, also, who are bringing Bible stories in new and exciting ways to school children and for the enthusiasm the children show in listening to the stories and responding to them. Thank you for the partnership the local church has with the Bible Society and we pray that they will be able to support each other to bring these stories to many other schools. 
We continue to ask for your blessing on all the camps and preparations that are being run and the preparations for camps are being run by Teen Ranch and SU Scotland. Give them fun, safe, exciting weeks and we pray that many young people will respond to Jesus in these special times. And Lord, we pray that you will bless us now as we turn to your word, speak to us and give us strength and grace and guidance to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue our worship by singing the hymn, What Gift of Grace. <coughs>
Let's share our prayer together. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your great glory our supreme concern, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I've always thought of rugby as a, a formal game. There's a very definite structure and pattern to the team and the way the team's set up and the way the game's played. The forwards go into the scrum and they win the ball and then they get it to the backs who quickly pass it along the line and, and fly running up eh, to score the tries. There's a definite pattern and a shape eh, to the way the game is played. It's quite different for example, from football, where a player can be given a, a floating role. That means he does nothing for 90 minutes and gets a, a huge salary. They, they can move all over the pitch and, and forwards can go up and down and backs can end up at, at the front and, and all sorts of things. It's a much more fluid game. But rugby um, has this shape or pattern. Our Christian life has a very definite shape and pattern to it. There are patterns which appear in our Christian living again and again. Patterns and shapes which appear in the lives of all the saints, those alive today and those who have gone before us over many years. If we would be effective and fruitful in our Christian living, we must attain to the shape of the Christian life not trying to go our own way, but living within the shape which has been prepared for us. In the verses which Gordon read earlier from 2 Corinthians 4, we notice that the Christian life is clay jar shaped, cross shaped, and bride shaped. In this very personal letter, the great Apostle Paul writes from his own experience of Christian living and following Jesus. Guided by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle writes for us of the shape of Christian living which we can imitate and follow as we follow Jesus in our turn. Paul's prayer in these verses is that the Corinthian Christians and we after them would be strengthened and built up in our Christian lives as we learn and live out in our days the shape of the Christian life. Paul wrote, we have this treasure in jars of clay. The goal of the Christian life is knowing God and living in the presence of God through Jesus our Savior in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the treasure which we have in jars of clay. By His grace, God has made known to us His wonderful glory in the face of Christ Jesus. It is for this the apostle counts the whole world as loss. We have this priceless treasure in our clay jar lives. Clay jars which were used in Corinth to store oil or wine, they were fragile. They still are. Often they would be burnt or broken, thrown away and replaced. Two a penny vessels which were never noticed and were never considered anything special. To a church which thought she was something great. A congregation in which the leaders styled themselves no longer apostles, but super apostles. Paul writes of his weakness. That the normal Christian life is shaped like a clay jar. Paul illustrates this. He says, we are hard pressed. The same word that was used in the Gospels when the crowd hard-pressed around Jesus, that he couldn't get space to talk to them and had to go and sit on a boat put out just a little from the shore because he was hard-pressed. And don't we often feel like that? 
everything seems to be pressing in upon us. There's so much to do in our own life, in our family, at our work. Never mind, there's so much to do in our service and mission, in our discipleship as we follow Jesus, in our service in the church. We are hard-pressed. But Paul writes, we are not crushed. We are perplexed. In the upper room, when Jesus said that one of the twelve would betray him, John records that they were at a loss to know what this meant. They were perplexed. They came to a standstill. Isn't that where we come to sometimes? We just don't know where the next step is. What do we do now? We are perplexed sometimes confused. Paul writes, we are not utterly at a loss. Persecuted. Sadly, we know that this is true for too many of our brothers and sisters in in the suffering church around the world. We know in a, a lesser way that this is true in our nation. For anyone who dares take a public stand as a disciple of Jesus, ridiculed, mocked, cursed and abused? Don't we know that the newspapers and the televisions will say things about Christians in our country that they would not dare say about anyone else? We are persecuted, but never alone. Struck down like a foundation laid out flat on the floor, like a boxer who's had that punch that flattens them to the canvas. But we are never destroyed, Paul writes. Sometimes I imagine Paul had written a different letter. If Paul had written a different paragraph here of glorious Christian living, of triumphs, of people coming to hear him preach and falling on their face and believing that Jesus was Lord, of miracles happening and people being healed and the blind seen and the dead being raised, and great triumph everywhere he went. If Paul had written that letter, how could we identify with him? What would we do with such words? There are Christians who talk like this, as though everything were glorious triumph, and and somehow it sounds false. The shape of the Christian life is clay jar shaped, obviously weak, but never destroyed. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Our lives are shaped to display weakness in order that for the purpose of displaying the glory of God. We dare not take any part of God's glory and give it to ourselves or to one another. Why would we steal from God in that way? If today we were to turn to the end of 2 Corinthians and we were to be impressed by all that the the Apostle Paul suffered, beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and times in prison and being abandoned. And if we thought Paul was great because he did all this, we've missed the point. If we think we need to be strong in ourselves to live the Christian life, we've missed the point. We're not living like jars of clay. There is a weakness built into our lives because we follow Jesus. That is the shape of our discipleship. There are no great ones in the church, only a great God and a great Savior. In our clay jar lives, when we are not crushed, when we are in despair but not abandoned, when we are not destroyed, it is His glory and His power at work in us. Above all things, the cross towers. 
Let there be nothing stand higher than the cross of Jesus. The shadow of the cross imposes itself upon all life, and especially upon the life of the disciple. In the same way as our fathers built cross-shaped church buildings, let us desire to build a cross-shaped Christian life. Paul wrote, we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Here Paul describes this cross-shaped living actively. We are to take up the cross to bear in our lives the death of Jesus. We are actively to strive to put ourselves to death that we might live in Jesus. All that is not of the Father is to be nailed to the cross, gossiping, envy, jealousy, rumor-making, grumbling. It's all got to die. Anger, spite, hatred, bitterness of heart towards one another. Upon the cross it must die. This is our lifelong struggle to put all these things and much more to death. And then Paul writes, we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Now passively, describing the same experience. God places the cross upon our lives. We are given by God over to being upon the cross. We can't escape from this dying. We are constrained by the cross. The shape of our Christian life is the cross. So then verses 10 and 11. I've read two bits from 10 and 11. Now I'm going to read the whole lot. Notice the bits I didn't read just a second ago. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our bodies. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. It is only once we have died that we are able to live a new life. Death not only comes before re resurrection, death causes resurrection. It is only when we die in Christ, united to him in his death, that we then become alive in Christ, raised with him to the new life. He died once for all, our death upon the cross, so that we might live, not I, but Christ in me. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he means exactly here, to take up our cross, to walk to the place of execution, to be put to death on the shape of the cross, that we might rise to new life. Dying and rising again, death to the old, resurrection to the new. This is the shape of our living. Our Christian life is not so much getting Jesus into me as getting me into Jesus. Dying at the cross to rise with him. As I die, life works itself in you. How do we care for one another, for the world? How do we engage in mission and service in our streets, in our parish, in our city? By dying to self and living for the other. How much am I to love you and you to love me? Dying upon the cross displays the extent of our love for one another. For any service I may do for others to be authentic, it must be, to be effective in Christ, I must die to self and live to Christ. Oh, how our bodies scream against this. Such dying is so unnatural to us. We long to live and, and to do by ourselves and for ourselves, to be able at the end to say, I did it my way. But my way isn't Jesus' way. My way isn't cross-shaped. My life needs to become his life. 
Our Christian life is to be bride-shaped. How does a bride appear when she is presented at the wedding service to her bridegroom? Beautiful, perfect, without blemish, spot, or stain, in every way prepared and made ready for the day. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus, Paul writes, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with all of you into his presence. Who is it who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead? God the Father did. Who then will raise us together with Christ? God the Father will. And who will present us in his presence? God will present us to Jesus in his presence. What is all this about? Just a few chapters later, Paul will write, I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you to Christ. The same word. A father brings his daughter on her wedding day. The gospel is spoken to prepare us for that day when we are brought and presented to Christ as his bride. Here at last there are no clay jars. There are no crosses or weaknesses. A beautiful bride presented to her loving bridegroom. This is certain and will happen. It is inconceivable that God will not prepare and present a bride to his son. Our Christian life is being shaped by this future for which we are being prepared. So you tell me, you who have been brides or mothers of brides and have shared the preparation for a wedding day, is every moment filled with joy and happiness? Clear sailing and nothing ever goes wrong. Is there not frustration, tears, cross words? Well, you have it your way then. Cherished hopes which have to be laid aside. But on that day, when the bride is presented beautiful and radiant to her bridegroom, it's all forgotten. That's the day. We are living in the preparation time. We are being made ready as a bride for Christ. Every day, a bit more ready One day, we will be presented to him and know his love and his grace, his person without limit or shadow or or any measure. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. This hope fills us with expectation and joy. We are being transformed from one degree of glory into another, into the the bride of Christ. But you see, all those others who, who watch our lives, who see the transformation happening in our lives, they too see Jesus being formed in us. And by God's grace, they long to see that transformation happening in their own lives. Our preparation as Christ's bride overflows to the thanksgiving and mission as others see what's happening. Our life cannot be hidden, but is to be seen by all for his glory. One of the great problems of our Christian life is trying to live today as though it were tomorrow. Our future in the Lord is great and glorious Eye has not seen and ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We are to encourage one another with these things. But we can't live today as though it were tomorrow. The work has started but is not yet finished. Thank God we are not now what once we were. But we are not yet what once we shall be. Our Christian life today is shaped by weakness. We are like clay jars. We are those who bear the cross. We are those who are being prepared. How loving and patient is our God to put up with us all these days, for we are slow 
and quick to turn aside. His mercy is great for us. His love for us is so great that He will shape our lives in such a way as to bring us into the likeness of Christ and make known the likeness of Christ to others. From glory into glory, through ways of weakness, His all-surpassing power will be seen in us. This is the shape of our life, so that all creation and we with it may know that everything, everything is from Him and by His grace. Let's pray together. Father, what gift of grace you have given us in Jesus, our Redeemer, that we would be led in weakness but transformed into glory. We pray that we would follow Jesus in these days when we are being prepared, when we are hard-pressed, when we are downtrodden, when we lose heart. May we follow Jesus in those days and know that we are not overcome by your grace. Give us eyes that we might see that you have already changed our lives and continue that work which you have started in us. Father God, fix our eyes on Jesus that we might always follow him, that our great desire might be to be more like Jesus. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing together. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free. When we share our communion together, uh, the elders here will bring round bread and wine and we'll pass up and down each row, holding on to the plates and trays um, as they do. On the trays of bread, there's a glass dish in the centre, uh, and in the glass dish, there's gluten-free bread 
if that's something uh, that you would prefer to share with us in communion. Also, uh, don't be surprised in the middle of our, our communion service, our choir are going to take part in our service at that time and sing for us this morning. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus said to him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. We come to this table of our Lord because Jesus invites us to remember him. Son of man who came to seek and to save the lost, the son of God who gave his life a ransom for many. The invitation is to all who love the Lord Jesus and who recognize their need of him. As we come to the Lord's table, it's good for us to hear once again the words of the institution of this sacrament, spoken by the risen Lord Jesus, given by him to his apostle Paul, who wrote them down in Scripture, that they might be given to us. We read these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sharing this meal calls us to remember the death of our Lord Jesus. His broken body and poured out blood are the gifts of God for us and our salvation. As we eat and drink together, so we enter into a spiritual union with our Lord Jesus, in which our sins are put to death with Christ on the cross, that we might rise again with him in the resurrection life. Sharing this meal points us towards that hope we have for the return of Christ, the renewal of creation, the fullness of the kingdom of God, when we shall see him as he is because we will have been made like him. Until that day, our sharing this meal calls us to live as citizens of the kingdom of God, to be his agents of peace and reconciliation, to tell all people that Christ has died but lives again. In this, we demonstrate our participation in Christ through this holy meal. Let us pray together. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for your gifts of grace and mercy to us. When we wandered far away from you, you sought us, and have carried us home. We give you thanks today for Jesus, your Son, who has been given for us. And we pray that day by day we would follow Jesus, that our lives would be made more like his. Gracious God, we bless you now and always for the gift of your Holy Spirit poured out upon us. We pray that your Spirit would fall upon us now, that by his work within us, we would recognize these gifts of bread and wine which we share as the body and blood of Jesus, our Savior. We pray that by your Spirit's work within us, you would make us one. Gracious God, be with us as we gather at this table to share your grace and love with one another. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Responding to Christ's invitation and depending upon the promised presence and help of God's Holy Spirit, we take bread and wine and we share them in token of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. Jesus took a cup and said, 
This cup is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed in my blood for you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Take, eat and drink. The body and blood of Christ are for you.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you immortal praise and thanks that you have poured such rich blessings upon us as to bring us into the communion of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom, having delivered up to death for us, you have given for our food and nourishment even to eternal life. Now grant us grace that we may never be unmindful of these things, but rather carrying them about, engraved upon our hearts, may advance and grow in that faith which strengthens us to every good work. In this may the rest of our lives be ordered and followed out to your glory and the building up of our neighbours. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns in the unity of the Godhead, world without end. Amen. We worship God as we sing together, Love divine, all loves excelling.
Let us go in the name of Jesus, our King, and in the power of his Holy Spirit, and the blessing of our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all, today and always.